Uh, good afternoon. Hello. What am I doing here? <laughs> I mean, of course, I'm honored and uh, delighted to be here, but also uh, puzzled. I'm very puzzled. I trust I don't have to explain um, honored, as there's no sense of an outsider presenting to insiders the illustrious and storied history of this fine, <laughs> if slightly suspicious, society. <laughs> um, and I trust I don't have to explain being delighted, as anyone who finds this delightful is already delighted, and anyone who doesn't find it delightful or unlikely to be swayed by a description of various giddy and bubbling properties currently inside my brain and or heart. <laughs> um, but I feel I should say something about puzzled. <coughs> uh, my puzzlement, I guess, is why I would be honored by a philosophical society of any stripe. Um, although I indulge in the occasional bout of late night whiskey adult philosophizing, <laughs> an activity I'm sure is foreign to anyone in this room, um, <laughs> I must admit, of course, that I'm best known for a sequence of 13 books in which terrible things happen <coughs> over and over to orphans. <laughs> <laughs> and that is not philosophical. <laughs> it is terrible. <laughs> but here I am, and I thought perhaps that I would become less puzzled, not just upon my arrival in Dublin, but my arrival here, here, but I have just come from a library that I've been waiting, it seems, my whole life to lay eyes upon, but only shortly before entering it did I learn that the library is organized according to size. That is puzzling to me. <laughs> and it has led to the kind of puzzlement that I experience often when I travel and uh, have occasion or are forced into occasion to speak about what it is that I do. It's an overwhelming sense of puzzlement, of what am I doing here? Um, not long ago, I uh, was kind of made to travel to the city of Atlanta, Georgia, in uh, the south of the uh, United States, where I'm from. It's a country, you know, that England used to own. <laughs> <laughs> you can read about it uh, later if you want to. Um, <laughs> And I checked into my uh, hotel. I'm just telling the story because it illustrates the same befuddlement and puzzlement of what I'm doing here. I checked into my hotel and I went into the elevator and I went into my room and uh, I opened the door of my room and I walked into the room and there, pinned to the wall, was a note. Pinned to the wall. And the note said, I'm going to kill you. And I found that alarming. <laughs> And so I put my things down, and I left the room, and I went back down the elevator to the lobby where the woman had just checked me in mere moments ago, and I said, there's a note, I said, pinned to the wall of my hotel room, and she said, what does the note say? And then I had to say to her, I'm going to kill you. And then we were both alarmed. <laughs> So she called not one but two security guards and a quartet of us went back up the elevator. And of course, all the time back up the elevator, I thought, if I'm in a movie, when I get there, the note will be gone. But I wasn't in a movie. I was in Atlanta. And <laughs> we got there, and there was the note, which was very exciting for the security guards. I don't think they'd had much reason to be security guards in a while, so they were very <laughs> excited. And they began to look at a, a, take a closer look at the situation. Now, I um, had with me in my travels then an accordion. I have not brought my accordion today because I have a policy that I only bring my accordion when I'm asked to bring my accordion because the question, why haven't you brought your accordion, is charming. And the question, why have you brought an accordion, <laughs> is alarming. <laughs> But I had with me there an accordion, and one of the reasons that my accordion alarms people, well, there are many reasons. One is that it's an accordion. But it also, it's, it's in a black 
case that couldn't look more like a bomb. It is a, it's a central casting bomb. It's something Boris and Natasha would carry around. And I had it there. In fact, it's, it, even if I had been asked to bring my accordion here to Ireland, I would have rented an accordion in Ireland instead because it's very hard to travel uh, on airplanes with an accordion because it looks like a bomb. And then when they open it and they find that it's an accordion, they're, they, it doesn't relax them at all. <laughs> they're not less concerned. And so the security guard looked at the note and he looked at the accordion and he asked me this question. What are you doing here? And what am I doing here? How did this narrative come to pass? How does any narrative come to pass in a post-colonial dystopia overseen by the panopticon embodying the corporate culture of late capitalism, which hangs over us like shelves of books organized by size? <laughs> in an attempt to answer this to a philosophical and debate society, uh, I'd like to turn to a short text, which I keep framed on my desk, uh, expressly for the purpose of reminding myself to brood. So I will read this text to you out loud, and you may brood along with me. Uh, the text is uh, a passage from a, a regular feature in an American uh, newspaper. In, well, it's in many American newspapers, including my local American newspaper. It's a Socratic uh, philosophical dialogue that takes place. I also notice an advice column between Dear Abby, who used to be a woman, but she's dead, and now she's never a different woman, and then everyday citizens write in to Abby with questions or concerns or observations. And sometimes one of their observations is presented by the philosopher without any comment whatsoever, <coughs> presumably because the everyday citizen has put the matter so exactly that no further interpretation is needed. So this is how the text goes. Dear Abby, a few days ago, while holding my infant son, Carl, in one hand, and a mobile phone in my other hand, I fell down 14 hardwood stairs. It isn't funny. I ended up with a black eye, six stitches, a fat lip, and a broken hand. Carl is fine. I hope my experience will help other busy mothers avoid such an accident. Signed, Black and Blue Mom. I don't think that's her real name. <laughs> now, I love this text very much because it illustrates a principle that has guided me throughout my life, which may or may not end here. The principle, I mean. And the principle involves avoiding temptation, a dangerous and pernicious kind of temptation, which is the most delicious kind. And the temptation is embodied in that last sentence, which is all alone in a paragraph by itself. I hope my experience will help other busy mothers avoid such an accident. It's the overwhelming temptation when we have a story to believe that the story has some kind of explanation or moral or some kind of framework so that the story can be said to be constructive. But in the case of Black and Blue Mom, how on earth would her experience help other busy mothers avoid such an accident? I mean, you could say the moral of the story is don't carry a baby and a phone at the same time. <laughs> but we all know that you can carry a baby and a phone at the same time and that you won't receive a fat lip as punishment. <laughs> so maybe the moral is always cover your hardwood stairs with carpeting. <laughs> Although that probably wouldn't help. Or never have a baby. <laughs> so you could hold the phone without being bothered. <laughs> Except Carl is fine. <laughs> So then maybe the moral is never use the phone, except if you fell down 14 hardwood stairs, you'd want to use the phone to call an ambulance. So really the moral is, thank goodness everyone's more or less okay, and it could have been much worse, which is hardly immoral at all, which might confuse the busy mother reading it. And so she would stop to read it again, while meanwhile her little child would be picked up by an eagle, <laughs> which had been circling the back porch waiting for such an opportunity, and then this eagle-induced kidnapping would tempt others to construct some kind of moral lesson, such as don't print confusing items in the newspaper, <laughs> because busy mothers may reread them, giving child-hungry eagles a window of opportunity. And this cycle of heartbreak and moralizing, catastrophe and finger-wagging would continue, rendering the world even more frightening and irritating than it is already. <laughs> so then, if they have no reliable moral, what can a story teach us? I find the answer in another short text, 
Uh, this one written by a young girl who wrote me a letter some time ago. I don't keep this letter framed on my desk because it is written in the lanky scrawl uh, that everyone uses as a child and some people never grow out of. Um, and that scrawl looks strange framed. Before I had a child, the letter looked very creepy framed on my desk, as if I had a mistress of inappropriate age. <laughs> and then after I had a child, I couldn't keep the letter framed on my desk because people would say, oh, is that from your son? And I would have to answer, no. <laughs> so the letter is not on my desk, but it is still important to me. There are many things important to me that are not on my desk. <laughs> Justice, for instance. <laughs> Jim. Jim is sometimes on my desk. Anyway, the letter. <laughs> Stop digressing. Uh, the letter goes like this Dear Mr. Snicket, I read your books. I enjoy them so much. I'm always curious when something happens. Your friend, Brandy. B R A N D I. Um, now, I am not usually a fan of the kids say the darndest things school of wisdom, but Brandy's statement is such a refreshing tonic, like a drink of brandy, really, to the insipid moralizing of the black and blue mom. I'm always curious when something happens. That's why most of that Dear Abby story is so interesting, because things happen. Carl, 14 hardwood stairs, a black eye, six stitches, a fat lip and a broken hand, which I think would be an excellent name for a singing duo. <laughs> that is why good literature is good, because we are curious when something happens. That and no other reason, certainly not a good reason, is why we engage with literature, despite what the moralizers may think. We do not read Madame Bovary to learn the lesson that adultery is bad, and we do not read Lolita to learn that the lesson of kidnapping a 14-year-old girl is not really worth the trouble. <laughs> and nobody reads the Bible as a literal document. That's a bad example. But, <laughs> I think that the rule is even stronger in childhood. You never love a book the way you love a book when you were 10. And virtually, uh, now when I fly virtually as far away from my home as I can, I meet children who stand in line, sometimes for hours, to recount to me the plot of the book I've written. <laughs> because they've been thinking about it. Because they're curious when something happens. And it's in this way that I feel I've succeeded in doing what I set out to do. Now, while it is true that you never love a book the way you love a book when you were 10, you also never hate a book the way you hate a book when you were 10. And although nowadays I read a lot of books I do not like, I don't throw them across the room as much, uh, more or less, as, as I used to. I miss the kind of scorn that I had for very bad literature and the spectacular noisy bounce of a book that I could throw across my childhood bedroom, which was, had some odd and strangely boxy walls. My childhood bedroom was an attic. In fact, when I was a child, I never understood what Anne Frank was complaining about because I had <laughs> love living in an attic. As long as I could go downstairs whenever I needed food and company. So the attic's walls were wonderful targets for pinballing books that I did not like. Um, I won't name any of the books, but uh, uh, among them were the following. <laughs> The names have been changed, etc. Um, one, our plucky hero or heroine is unpopular at school or at summer camp or at His Majesty's Kingdom. But eventually, the bullying of our hero stops and everyone loves them and the bully gets his comeuppance and everyone joins our hero or heroine in a rousing game of kickball or a rousing raid on the cabins of the opposite sex or a rousing marriage to the beautiful princess. Two, our plucky hero or heroine is lured into drugs by a distinctly non-plucky anti-hero <laughs> who conveniently dies of them. Three, our plucky hero or heroine's family experiences a difficulty. Illness, death, moving, drinking, <coughs> unemployment, a baby, and overcomes it with the wit of one relative and the wisdom of another, and at the end, everyone has a nice, hot meal. Uh, four, our plucky hero evades Nazis. Now, all of these stories enraged me, because it was not so. It wasn't that the books didn't mimic life, because I don't think someone who was, written a, who was responsible for a book in which an infant climbs up an elevator shaft using only her teeth, then gets to stand at a podium and demand realistic fiction. <laughs> the book 
books just didn't mimic the way life was shaped. I was learning as a child the lessons we all learn. Sooner or later, there's always a click which will exclude you, so it is best to ignore rather than attempt to befriend or confront those who simply will not have you. Bullies never get their comeuppance, which is good news. Forgotten rather than come up. Drugs don't kill people based on whether they're plucky or not, and it's precisely the random nature of their destruction that makes them so dangerous and so seductive. And family traumas are never quite overcome, but may eventually be absorbed, and that you should have a nice hot meal in any case. <laughs> Preferably bouillabaisse. And then there's the lesson that the Holocaust has taught us, one of them anyway, a lesson nowhere to be found in the books I bitterly flung across the room, uh, the books I was most often given as a child, because my father, when he was young, but no pluckier than the average German Jew, evaded the Nazis and came to America. And my father taught me the lesson when he asked me something. I had gone to school and as part of a lesson on immigration told the story of his fleeing from Germany in 1939, and the teacher had told me my father was very brave. Uh, I went home and repeated the compliment to my father because he was a certified public accountant and he probably didn't get called brave a lot. <laughs> and when I said, don't you think you were very brave, he upheld the Jewish tradition of answering a question with a question and asked me, do you think I was braver than the ones who didn't make it? And there it is, it's like a slap in the face from Brandy to the black and blue mom the difference between how they tell you it's going to go, the moral of the story, that brave and plucky people will be rewarded with a happy ending, such as, in the case of Germany in 1939, survival, and the way it goes instead, the fact that I grew up in an attic bedroom because the country went mad with xenophobia and power. I realize that's hard to imagine nowadays, but imagine if you will. <laughs> Some country going mad with xenophobia and power. Belgium, say. Um, <laughs> because my father's childhood home backed up against the woods where children could call when evil people came calling, uh, where children could hide when evil people came calling, and because the bride happened to work at the border when so many times it didn't, and because nobody thought to look inside my grandmother's shoe, the heel of which she had hollowed out herself and filled with diamonds for which she had traded everything she owned to a man who turned out to be trustworthy when so many men did not. That was the sort of story I wanted to read, in which the chaos and tumble of life was acknowledged rather than denied with a plucky smile. When I was 10, I wanted to read about terrible things happening over and over, <laughs> like a mother falling down 14 hardwood stairs and ending up with a black eye, six stitches, and appearing tonight in the Stardust Lounge a fat lip and a broken hand. <laughs> in other words, I wanted to read a series of unfortunate events, but no one had written such books, and so along with so many young people, uh, particularly boys, I abandoned the fodder I was offered and took comfort in Agatha Christie, uh, who teaches you that the reason you shouldn't commit murder is that you'll probably forget some crucial detail and be caught <laughs> by a little old lady or a Belgian man in a black hat. <laughs> and V.C. Andrews, who teaches you that you should not have sex with someone who is holding you captive. <laughs> no matter how tempting the prospect may be. <laughs> These lessons have served me well. <laughs> They inspired me to try to write an interesting story of my own, which eventually became my first novel. My first novel is called The Basic Eight. It tells the story of a girl in high school who has a crush on a boy in high school, and he does not return her affections, and so she bludgeons him to death with a croquet mallet. <laughs> it's a comedy. <laughs> it was based upon a tumultuous and chaotic story that happened when I was an adolescent. There was a murder in several towns towns over from where I grew up in a high school. And for some reason, because of the nature of the murder, which went unsolved for a very, very brief period of time, they decided that the murder was due to a satanic cult. And that, as media narratives go, spun into a moral lesson of we better stamp out Satanism in high schools across America. Is there a satanic cult in your child's high school? How many Satanists are there in the high schools across America? And I was in high school at the time, and you know, I was in the drama club, 
Uh, and I just thought if there was a satanic cult, I would know about it. <laughs> and it, there wasn't a satanic cult. And of course, the true story turned out not to be, is there a satanic cult in your high school? The true story was, is there someone in your high school who doesn't like somebody else in your high school? A much more complicated question. Now, it took me some time to get the basic eight uh, published, and it wasn't a fun time, really, for me. I was young. Not much older than uh, you are, some of you. Um, and if I were in a children's book, my youth and my pluck would have been rewarded with a record-breaking advance for a publisher. But in the years that followed, all I received were many rejection letters. And to alleviate this suffering, I took up a hobby. Um, I was employed at the time as an administrative assistant at the Computer Science Department at the City College of San Francisco. <laughs> Uh, you notice that I can say that very quickly because I would answer the phone, computer side from City College of San Francisco. <laughs> Sometimes now, I'm still working very, I'll be working very hard, I'll be in the zone, and uh, the phone will ring and I will pick it up and I will say, computer science from City College of San Francisco. <laughs> and my wife will say, darling, it was a long time ago. <laughs> you don't work there anymore. <laughs> Uh, but I did work there, and the job consisted mostly of picking up the phone and saying computer science problems in San Francisco, which frequently interrupted me while I was reading. Um, despite this task, there were two uh, principal advantages to working at the computer science problems in San Francisco. One was stealing paper, uh, which for a young novelist made the job a kind of government grant. Uh, and the other was that, for some reason, uh, there were subscriptions to every tiny neighborhood newspaper in San Francisco delivered to the Computer Science Conference at City College of San Francisco. These newspapers were very small. I actually have been looking for them in my wanderings around town over the past couple days in Dublin, but maybe the weather has washed them away. Um, they were called things like the Knob Hill Gazette and the Parkside Express, and this is where my hobby would come in. I would read these tiny, harmless newspapers from cover to cover, and I would find the tiniest, most harmless article in them. And then I would compose on the typewriter of the Computer Science Department at City College of San Francisco, because that's what we had at the Computer Science Department at City College of San Francisco, were typewriters. I would compose outraged letters to the editor regarding these articles. <laughs> I was simply following the footsteps of all the books I'd hated as a child. The articles were not interesting stories, and the moral lessons I insisted they taught in my outraged letters were absurd and unbelievable. If an official announced that street cleaning uh, schedules had changed from Wednesdays to Fridays, I would point out that that was doubtlessly rooted in anti-Semitism. <laughs> they said they were giving away balloons at a park. I would accuse them of trying to choke birds with the popped rubber remnants. <laughs> Anti-litter editorials were obviously insensitive to avant-garde paper sculpture. Things like that. <laughs> it was a hobby. No, the letters all had two things in common. They all began with the sentence, How dare you! <laughs> exclamation point. Because nothing commands respect. Like, how dare you! Exclamation point. And then they closed not with my own name, because why would I want to be associated with these letters? And particularly because any minute now, I was sure that the base gate was going to sell for a record-breaking advance. But I signed them with a name that I devised on the phone with a right-wing political group. Uh, some sections of the Basic Eight make fun of ridiculous right-wing groups, and so I was writing away to ridiculous right-wing groups, asking, me, uh, asking them to mail me their material so I could mock them in my as-yet-unpublished novel. <laughs> and um, I didn't, of course, want to be on the mailing lists permanently of such groups, because how embarrassing that would be when my novel sold for a record-breaking advance. And so this right-wing woman on the phone asked me for my name, and I uttered the first thing that came into my head, which was, Lemony Snicket. Mm -hmm. And then there was a pause. And during that pause, I thought to myself, that was a very idiotic name. <laughs> Out of all the names you could have made up on the spur of the moment, that is idiotic. Who could possibly be enough of an idiot to believe that was a real name? And then the right-wing woman said, is that spelled how it sounds? <laughs> and I said, yes. And then I asked her to read it back to me, because I had no idea how it sounded. <laughs> and I wrote it down. And it became part of something that I'm writing down to this day, an imaginary world that I find not so difficult to imagine, in which a hapless young man wanders through a dark and mysterious landscape full of catastrophe and strife that we might nickname a series of unfortunate events, 
asking what we might also nickname all the wrong questions. <coughs> Not coincidentally, these are the names of a series of books. In a, ser uh, in a series of unfortunate events, three orphans lose their parents and their home in more or less that order, and then find themselves bitten by reptiles, lost in a hurricane, working at a lumber mill, going to gym class, thrown down an elevator shaft, chased out of town by an angry mob, undergoing unnecessary surgery, performing in a freak show, sledding. <laughs> I'm from California, so that was just as terrifying to me as everything else. <laughs> Inhaling poisonous spores, uh, checking into a badly run hotel, and finally helping out with the birth and death of people important to them, while the mystery of their miserable circumstances only looms larger and paradoxically farther away with every sad, strange, and sadly strange moment. In All the Wrong Questions, which is the other series of book, uh, books, young Lemony Snicket, not yet 13, abandons his parents in a lousy restaurant, although they are not actually his parents, and gets in the roadster of his chaperone, although she's not very good at chaperoning, in order to meet his associate with whom he is planning a heist, although he doesn't get there as he is assigned to a distant town where he investigates the theft of an object that has not been stolen, and ends up stealing it himself. He rescues a woman from downing in a basement, although she doesn't want to be rescued, and he is rescued after falling from a great height into a tree by someone who ought not to have rescued him and isn't interested in rescuing him anyway, although she is interested in stealing the stolen item that wasn't stolen to begin with. There is then a kidnapped girl who turns out neither to be kidnapped nor the girl who was kidnapped, and it turns out that the kidnapped girl who wasn't kidnapped gets kidnapped as part of a plot to steal the stolen statue. So that the case of the stolen statue that wasn't stolen and the kidnapped girl who wasn't kidnapped becomes one case of stolen kidnappings and kidnapped stolens. Now, <laughs> Uh, just recently was published volume three, Shouldn't You Be in School? A question that I'm sure everyone here asks themselves from time to time, in which a school on fire turns out to be neither a school nor on fire, a mysterious mystery mystifying the mysterious author who finds himself still investigating the mysteries of the mysterious town, and all the while he is surrounded by an enormous mystery, shadowy and menacing and causing him great inconvenience and promising nothing as ridiculous and boring as a happy ending. But what ties that together then? How does he go on and on, and why does he keep asking questions if the answers make him not want to go on? But why do we? Well, Mr. Snicket is a member of a suspicious organization. They raise him and they nurture him. Although, like most people who raise and nurture us, they also drive him crazy and drive him away. Nonetheless, he is a proud member, investigating on their behalf, reporting under their auspices. So that every story he tells, every word he writes down, is in the service of their philosophical ideals. I have a basement packed with letters from children, packed with questions. And the question they ask most is, is it real? Is there actually a secret organization of literature? And I say, yes, and you are in it. It is why all of us can wander this world feeling like young mystified apprentices with bad chaperones or like orphans, pondering their fate about escaping from it, desperate and lost in a world of chaos and tumble, in which your parents can escape from Nazis and your elementary school days could be filled with loathsome bullies, that your first novel could insect, in fact, eventually <coughs> sell for a record-breaking amount, which was the least amount of money my literary agent had ever negotiated for a work of fiction, <laughs> that horrible things could happen again and again and again, like a mother falling down 14 hardwood <laughs> stairs. But, but this is so rarely acknowledged, except in bitter, rambling letters to the editors of tiny, harmless newspapers, signed with the secret name of a man with an overwhelming sense that the paltry, finger-wagging books of childhood were not merely an unpleasant state of memory, not merely an exaggeration of a novelist tailoring his past to match his current taste, and most importantly, merely a lump of bitter coal amidst millions of lumps of bitter coal simmering away under the burning collective gaze of members of a society so overbludgeoned by the anvil of capitalism that they dare not speak out for stories that might excite and matter, a gaze that would ignite all this lumpy coal into a flaming barbecue of mediocrity, but a challenge, a gaping void, a cosmic injustice, a blank page on which I could take my mighty pen and inscribe corrective, inspiring, chaotic, and tumbling stories in the ink of brutal, inevitable, glorious literary truth, the only truth worth the page on which it is printed, and that all of us, all of us in a suspicious society, can ask all the wrong questions about a series of unfortunate events, 
narrated by a man bewildered by this parade of terrible things happening to small children, who knew his bravery and his pluck would count for nothing, but nevertheless had a brash, truthful sense, as we all do, particularly if there is whiskey nearby, that the way of the world is not an experience that can help other busy mothers avoid such an accident. It is a black eye, six stitches, a fat lip, and a broken hand. It is a series of unfortunate events. It is all the wrong questions. It is a library organized by height. <laughs> because it is always interesting when something happens and that, ladies and gentlemen, of this suspicious society, that is what I am doing here. I speak to you currently from a difficult place when something I tried to say about literature and culture came out horribly wrong. If you don't know what I'm talking about, good for you, you're my favorite person in the room. He <laughs> me during all tumultuous times, his books and the philosophy they offer. I am grateful for any philosophical society that is willing to treat me as a member. Thank you very much.